All right. All right. Let's see what we got here. Uh, meetings have been live streamed. Got it. Okay. So Tina, thank you for joining me. I, um, I have to tell you, I'm super excited about doing this live interview. Go Facebook live. I've never done a Facebook live interview before. Um, but I did do a salad gate interview one time before that went viral. So uh, I have some experience with it, just not great experience with it. So um, before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about um, what the topic's going to be uh, uh, in this interview, and then um, uh, a little bit about the event that you're holding next week on the 4th and 5th. So um, tell me a little bit about what you're doing on your event and how it helps real estate agents today. Sure. Um, I noticed a huge gap with realtors when I started my team and that nobody had really taught them how to sell. And so I started creating trainings for them to be more successful and close more transactions. And they just took off like gangbusters. I mean, they were winning awards like crazy with the volume and their net sales. And I started realizing that this was a problem kind of across the board. So I created, first of all, I wrote a book, Relationship Real Estate. It actually releases April 5th on Kindle. And then a couple of days later on Amazon called Relationship Real Estate and the two-day workshop. And the one that we're doing in Orlando is based off of that book. And it is corporate level sales training for real estate agents. And it puts the whole sales process into a sales, into sales steps. So when I went to your event, it really broke it down on um, really how to get into relationship and how to manage your business properly through relationships in real estate. So I, I'm really excited. I'm going to be there actually on the fourth and the fifth for your event. It's the second time I've been to this. So anybody that's in there listening to this Facebook live um, interview, I will tell you, I happen to have four tickets left that will get you in the door and it goes from is it 8 30 to 4 or uh is that it's 9 to 3 the first day with a happy hour following so that everybody can network with each other and then it's 9 to 3 on the second day okay perfect so yep. i want to get started on this facebook live i'm uh i don't even know how to see if anybody's even watching us right now and it doesn't really <laughs> matter i can tell you this much there is a huge issue with people and that are struggling, particularly buyers trying to get in the market. And you have a couple of options. You can buy new construction and buy a production home build. The benefits are is they've got homes. The drawbacks are is that you may be on a waiting list and it may take you nine to 10 months to build. Secondly is I don't know any of those that aren't in HOA subdivisions. And I don't know about you, but I can't even park my jet ski in the side yard in some of these communities. So that doesn't fit the lifestyle for some folks. It does fit the lifestyle for a lot of folks, but it's not for everybody. The other option is you could build your own home on your own lot or go buy a lot and do a construction perm loan. I've got those products and we can talk about those in a different interview but those are your three options right now. The problem is, is that if you're trying to buy a resale home today, we're up against multiple offers. And I got to be honest with you, Tina, come, I was thinking that when rates started to go up, that this problem was going to start going away. And I'm not seeing it going away any better. I thought we'd go from 15 offers on every house to five down to three. I'm still back up to 10 offers on a house. So what are you experiencing with that? Um, across the board, like all of my national coaching clients, everybody that I work with, they're starting to see a little bit of a slowdown. They're not getting bombarded with buyers calling them. I know the national average is that um, loan applications is down 20% this year, this first quarter, which is a positive thing. I don't want people to get freaked out about that because the bottom line is, is that we want for the market to kind of regulate a little bit more and for there to be a better ratio with buyers and sellers. I, I think most of that 20 to 30% is because the refinances are mostly gone. I mean, you have yeah. to remember the last two years, two and a half years have been a refinance boom for people. If they didn't refinance, they should have refinanced. Now, a lot of folks haven't, and those are still uh, 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 kind of dribbling in a little bit, 
but I think that's most of it. I still, my, I look at the new client leads that I get every month, where they come from and what my conversion rate is on those. And my, uh, my new leads are not really that much different, maybe 5% lower this month in March than they were in January. February was kind of in the middle, but I'm not seeing a significant drop, 5% maybe, but I don't know about you, Tina, but 5% up and down on any given month is not even uncommon. You don't even have to have a change in the market to have a 5% shift in your leads in any given month. Right. And you guys, we, we just had spring break and all those other things. And those things play a factor in how many people are applying for loans or not. Maybe they're going on vacation this month instead of trying to buy a house. Right. So we don't know yet what the, the rates are going to be doing, but for the next few months, at least the next several months, we're still going to be in this situation where we have buyers literally fighting to the death to try to get these homes. Right. We are. And I so, wanted to backtrack on something you said too. You said something about new home builds. The other thing that we have to watch out as realtors with new home builds is the escalation clause. A lot of builders have the escalation clause in their contracts now where they reserve the right to change the price on you. That's scary. So, and they almost have to. In their defense, they almost have to because they don't know what the cost of the building the house is. But oh my gosh, you know, we're already seeing clients uh, that are. Um, losing a home that they're in the process of building because they went into they went into contract 10 months ago when rates were 2.875 and now mm -hmm. they're four and a quarter or four and a half or four and three quarters. I'm predicting that we're going to see sixes in our rates in a in, in a relatively short period of time. We saw the largest rate increase in one week since 2013 last week. So it's that trend is going to continue. Um, yes. So I want to get on with the interview here because right now the um, the the the, uh, the problem that we are seeing is multiple offers. So I talked to you a little bit about this, and you said that you were training people on how they could elevate uh, the percep their perception of their client in the eyes of the listing agent or the seller to be able to uh, up the chances on them becoming the winning offer. So I've got a few questions that I wrote down that I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead. So first of all, um, I think that there are some key factors that need to go into this. So if whoever's listening needs to take some copious notes on this. So first of all, what do you think about, you know, waiving the appraisal contingency? What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? Here's what I was saying in a class yesterday. It's not our money. If your client is hell bent that they are going to get their offer accepted, that this is the home that they are in love with, and they will do anything that it takes to get that home and they have the cash, then why are you holding them back at this point? Just because you have a limiting belief that you wouldn't pay more for a home than what it appraises for, why are you putting that on other people? You don't know their finances. You don't know their circumstances, really. They're probably not even being completely honest with you about why they need a home so quickly. So stop putting your own beliefs on them. If that's what they want to do and you've explained it to them, let them waive the appraisal. Yep, I think that, that, Let them do now, it. And you know what? I believe that and I think that you're correct. And- but having said that, understanding your client's needs, some people just can't do that. They're right. capped out. They don't have any yeah. more money. So why negotiate something that they couldn't perform with, even if you got the contract? So knowing your client is super important, but knowing your client and knowing your client's capability of going above and beyond. And I've always asked the client, at what point would you be okay with losing the transaction? And what point would you be willing to look back and go, you know what? I probably would have been willing to go another three, four or 5,000 bucks. So you have to ask yourself that. Thank you. So what can a buyer do to make uh, a great first impression? Because to be honest with you, you it's just like dating. You got one chance that that seller is going to like you or not like you right off the bat. And we know in real estate that oftentimes it may be the perception of the listing agent and it never even got to the seller. So what would be, what would you think to do to be able to make that first impression right out of the gate? 
Well, what I tell my agents and anybody that I coach is when you're sending in an offer to an agent, make sure that you are bullet pointing in the email. I don't know how many of you out there are listing agents, but when you're getting 30 offers coming in and you have to click on the contract every single time and print and make sure that it goes into the right piles, it's a nightmare. But if somebody bullet points their offer in the email and they're like, okay, so we're offering this where this is when we want to close, this is what type of loan we're getting, where it's cash or whatever the case may be, and, and mapping those terms out in bullet points in the email. And then if you're adding in an appraisal contingency waiver, or let's say, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, let's say you are allowing your earnest money to go hard after the inspection has been agreed upon, or you're paying seller closing costs, or any of these other methods that I teach, then you need to bold those in your bullet points so that they stand out among everything else because those are the terms that are going to set you apart from everybody else. It also shows the listing agent that you're diligent and that you're going to be easy to work with. And that's really important to listing agents these days, okay. especially in so Florida, you, I got to tell you. I want to, I well, thank you for that. I want to just kind of clarify that. So you mentioned about letting your earnest money go hard after inspections. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how, what else can we do about inspections? Because I know that inspections can go, you know, if the, if that buyer doesn't order those inspections right away, I don't know how far inspectors are out these days. You would probably have a better idea than I am, but mm -hmm. I would imagine that to get an inspector to the house in three to five days is going to be difficult to do, but what are you recommending that they do? I recommend that they have a relationship with at least three to four inspectors that they contact each of them. If their client really wants this home, this is a 9.5 out of 10 for this buyer. Go ahead and call ahead of time and pre-schedule that inspection for like, let's say the offer is being accepted Monday night. That's when they're answering all offers. Go ahead and have it set for Tuesday morning or Tuesday afternoon so that you can let the listing agent know as soon as you're putting in that offer, hey, by the way, I tentatively have the inspection scheduled because I am hoping you are choosing our offer. So I went ahead and did that so that we can meet our three to five days, Make whatever you decide. Close. Absolutely, 100%. And I can tell you as a listing agent, I have accepted people's offers because of that, because I don't want to waste time with a longer inspection. So right now um, I'm finding that uh, um, there's a lot of folks that want to close quickly and they believe that closing mm -hmm. fast might get the seller's attention. What do you think about that? You know, it's interesting. We assume that that's what a seller wants. But what if we're dealing with a seller that still lives in the home and they have a ton of stuff throughout the home? Why can't we say, you know what, we're willing to close in the 30 days, possibly sooner if our lender is willing to do it. And we're going to give your buyer a couple of extra weeks to move out. So, um, and in terms of making sure that anybody that's listening to this understands the guidelines, if the buyer is buying the home owner occupied, the seller can do up to a 60 day lease back and be in compliance with the loan. So you can go up to 60 days. And I think that that quite frankly, is something I'm seeing people do more and more because you have to remember the buyer and the seller have actually similar problems, right? The, the buyer may be a seller as well. The seller may be a buyer as well. So mm -hmm if they understand what each other, other's needs are, I think offering to close fast, saying we can close in 21 days, we can close in less than 30 days, even though the seller may not be interested in that, shows that the buyer is ready, willing, and able to move quickly. And I think that mm -hmm. that's important for the agent to convey that um, when making an offer. And sellers so, are looking for more flexible terms on move out because maybe they don't even have the home that they're moving into identified yet. Yeah, so being yeah. able to say to the listing agent, by the way, my clients are flexible on when they have to move in. So if your client needs more time, we'll still close. We'll put a post occupancy in place and give them the time that they need, whether it's two weeks, whether it's a month, whether it's two months. And that tends to win over sellers because you're flexible. Yeah, I think that flexibility is probably more important today than it ever was before. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you're also seeing 
some buyers uh, taking on some responsibilities of sellers these days. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, one of the things, especially if you're worried about appraisal or whatever, and your client has some extra money, but they don't have a ton of extra money. Let's say they have an extra $5,000 and they're maxed at their offer. They can offer to pay for seller closing costs up to $5,000 because that's what they have. And that's one of those bullet point items that they're like, oh, wait a minute. So they're going to cover our, our closing costs. That's great. And it's very easy to do on a settlement statement. Your title companies definitely know how to do it, but it's a different way to win it. And sometimes you can combine these items too. Like we're going to waive the appraisal contingency up to a certain amount. Right. We're willing to pay some, some closing limitations costs for that. the seller. Right. Put some limitations if you need to. We're, we're allowing $5,000 of our earnest money Money to go hard. You know, maybe you're putting 20,000 down as earnest money because that makes your offer look that much stronger. But you know what? After the inspection period is over and agreed to, we're willing to let 5,000 of that be released to the seller immediately. Yep. I think that's great information. So I do some things also, Tina, that I think I'm able to increase my buyer's chances on becoming the winning offer against cash or against a higher offer by up to 70%. You can't be 100%, but right. you can raise that elevation. Um, and so I've put together some things and I thought maybe you may be able to ask me some questions and I could cover those as well. Well, one of the things that I've noticed, especially in Florida, being here for the past six weeks and watching what everybody is going through, there's a lot of transactions that fall out because they were pre-qualified, but they weren't really pre-approved. Right. So can you explain that a little bit? So a pre-qualification is a lender having an interview with a client, maybe pulling their credit, but there's no validation. A pre-approval is generally where most lenders stop because they'll get the pay stubs, the W-2s, you know, maybe the divorce decree, the tax returns, the assets, they'll verify all those things. Hopefully. The problem is, is that a lot of lenders get overzealous and they actually don't do the work because if I don't get a client's divorce decree and they're paying child support, how do I really know how much money they're paying? And could that debt ratio affect their qualification? So I don't allow my team to write a pre-approval until they're fully pre-approved. But today, if you're competing against cash, you got to be as good as cash. So how can I do that? What I can do. If my client's not paying cash, but I got to get them to look as close to cash as possible, I will do what we call our fast track loan approval, Tina. And that is I'll physically underwrite the loan because a pre-approval is written by the loan officer. They didn't underwrite right. the loan. They're not even capable of underwriting the loan. But so I'll mm -hmm. put it in front of an underwriter. I'll get full loan approval. And when I get full loan approval, the only way that I'm not going to close is if they're if there is an appraisal issue, a title issue, or my buyer were to pass away or lose their job before we close. Anything else, it's going to close. All Everything's mm -hmm. been underwritten. Their loan's ready to go, which allows me to close in 21 days or less. But here's what it does as well. It will, that if my client is fast-tracked approval, and I'm going to tell you, there's nothing better than fast-tracked approval. I will make an honor call to the listing agent and I will share with them that if I do not close that loan on time, I will pay the seller up to $500 a day for every day that I miss the closing. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I have no intention on paying $500 a day and I won't pay $500 not. a day. What I will do is actually close on time. And I get calls all the time from realtors going, yeah, we're on our second extension. Why are you on a second extension? What happened that is causing this to have a second extension? Unless somebody didn't tell me that the seller was in probate or something, there should be no reason to have extensions. So right. that one of the things I do is I make that honor call to the listing agent and I make them a guarantee that I'm going to close that transaction on time. Wow. I mean, that's a huge, you have $500 a day you're going to pay them. I mean, that's, and that I put it in writing. This is a seller's mind. So that would be one of those bullet point things that I was talking about. If you're the lender and I'm sending out an email, I'm going to say, by the way, here's my lender's contact information. And if he doesn't close on time, he's going to pay out $500 a day. That's right. That it doesn't close. 
That's right. huge. That's a huge value proposition. Yep. Yep. What else, yeah, what else would you like to know? Well, so we're seeing people, I mean, contingencies, <laughs> contingencies on them selling their home is a huge problem across the board, whether they don't qualify because of their DTI, so they have to sell it, or whether they're trying to put 20% down and that's why they wanna sell their home first. So how do you go about that as a lender? So Either contingencies are probably the biggest roadblock for a client because there's so many offers on the table. Why would I have to wait for you to put your house on the market to sell it? I can just pick another buyer. So. We have to do whatever we can to remove the contingencies, but we cannot lie about that. There's no room for a lender to not put a contingency on a pre-approval that really has a contingency. I think personally that's malpractice. It will never happen under my watch, but I right. see it happening all the time. The, the, a, a realtor will accept an offer and find out later that there really was a contingency. So there's a couple of things that we can do. We need to either lighten the load of contingencies or remove them completely. So I've got a client right now that they were told they couldn't buy because it was a contingency. Well, it was only because they thought they had a contingency. So they wanted to sell their home in Texas and move here. They did not want to wait uh, or they did not want the seller to perceive that they had to sell, but they had limited cash, Tina. So what okay. I did is I thoroughly reviewed their file and I said, you have enough money to borrow from your 401k, put down 5% on this house. I can make, I can, I can qualify you without selling the home and I will get you approved and write an approval with no contingencies. And so we did it and those offers come in all the time. When there's no contingencies, it makes it easy for a seller to make a decision. Now Absolutely. there's some drawbacks to that. And I know you had questions about that because if you're putting 5% down, but you're sitting on $200,000 in equity on a house you hadn't sold yet, there are people are kind of like, ah, I didn't want to put 5% down, right? Right. Right. Everybody has this preconceived notion that they have to put 20% down in order to avoid PMI, but you have a way that they can put 5% down and then you can fix it when they have the cash to I have can. the 20%. So what down. we do is we, we qualify, we, let's just say that they didn't sell the house before we close on the new one and they got to perform on the 5% down. Mm -hmm. So we close 5% down they pay private mortgage insurance. It's okay. We turn around, we sell that other house. Now they want to throw 150 grand on a mortgage. Well, when you throw money on a mortgage, all it does is pays the loan off sooner. It doesn't change your payments. I have a program called recasting the loan. What I do is I'll take that money. It's got to be a minimum of $5,000. It costs $250 to perform the, the act and I will recast their loan. So they can put whatever money they want on it and I'll redo the payments based on the new, the new loan balance. And if they put 5% down and now they're at 20% down, I remove the mortgage insurance right away. So it solves so it only, all it's, They don't have all the closing costs on that. Again, they're not refinancing. It's called recasting no. and it only so costs recast. them $250. You can do it one time. And it's got to be at least five thousand dollars. So wow. it's it's an easy it's an easy way to fix the problem, and it's been solving a lot of problems. One of the other things that we will do is, let's just say that my my client's debt ratio was too high based on a contingency. Well, if they can throw a lease on their current residence, I can defray that payment so that it takes it out of their debt load. Now qualify them to buy the house. And they can rent it or they can turn around later and sell it. I don't care right. what they do after closing. Now, you're not here to commit fraud on a mortgage and tell me you're going right. to rent a house that you're not going to rent. But if you can bring me a legitimate lease agreement on your departing residence, I can use that to offset the payment. I can wash well, it. I can't show profit, but I can wash it. And here's the thing too, what most people are afraid of. I was just having this conversation with somebody today. They were like, well, can I, can I still sell it if I rent it out? 
Yes, there are a ton of investors out there right now that are looking for homes that already have tenants in them. It's they, a no-brainer. That's what they're looking for. And it doesn't matter if it's a $500,000 home, a million-dollar home. Nope. There are investors out there, cash buyers, that are looking for those homes that already have the tenant. So Absolutely. if you do that, I want to caution you to make sure that you get a lease, that you that you have a property management company determine what the, the value of the rent should be, and that that is exactly what you're getting the rent for so that you can turn around and sell that home with the tenant in there. Yep. 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 Absolutely. 100%. Um, yeah. So what other questions might you have for me? Um, let me look here. So we talked a little bit about our honor call and getting the listing agent's attention. The, mm -hmm. We talked about my seller guarantee of $500 a day. Um, yep. So you mentioned your escrow. Okay. Yes. And making your escrow hard. So I think that if you want to get the seller's attention, and you're coming in and you're going to put 5, 10, 20% down, then put 5, 10, 20% down into escrow when you make your offer. Because you get some realtors and they go, well, how, you know, how much, you know, they'll ask the, the realtor, how much should I put down? I don't know, $2,000, $5,000 in escrow. No, you're putting 20% down on a $500,000 house, put $100,000 in escrow. That'll get the seller's attention. You're not going to lose it really your money does. if the deal doesn't go through. Escrow is a big deal. And I can tell you as a listing agent, when I get several offers in, I'm looking at what that escrow amount is. That's part of the terms that I'm advising my clients about. Because if they've only got 5,000 in and this person's got 20,000 in, they have a lot more to lose at 20,000. They're going to perform everything that they need to perform. Absolutely. There's a lot more at risk in that, in that position. And there's a lot less risk for my seller. And I got to tell you, in general, Florida and escrow amounts mind boggle me. Now, here's what I want to say to you. If you're putting 20% down and in the escrow section, okay, and you're also going to allow earnest money to go hard after a certain period of time in the transaction, let me tell you something, you have to protect your client and make sure that you're not allowing that whole 20% or 10% to go hard, that you're putting no. a limit of, let's say $5,000 or $10,000, whatever, with the price point of the home really matters in that scenario. So if it's a million dollar plus home, then maybe $10,000 go hard, goes hard after the inspection period has been right. and everything has been. You don't need hard. to make it all go hard. No, absolutely not. And that was one thing that people kept coming up to me and saying, well, so I'm just going to let $100,000 go hard. No, no, put a limit no. on it. You can put a limit on anything. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I got to tell you, this was a lot of information. I hope that anybody listening to this Facebook live uh, learned something from this and can have some takeaways so they can help their buyers and their sellers because it has to be a win-win for everybody. And I wanted to address one more thing because uh, one of the things that people think about is like, well, I just can't compete against a cash offer. And I think that's entirely wrong. What do you mm -hmm. think about that? I think that we can definitely compete against cash offers. Yes, cash offers tend to come in a little bit lower, but cash buyers have been getting a lot more savvy in the, when they really want a property with going above asking. So I think that cash buyers are more desirable to sellers because their realtors have told them, well, they can close faster, you know, all of these different things. But the bottom line is this, cash buyers are going to ask more to be fixed on the home. They just are. They're going, everything's going to be on their time frame yep. because they're cash. Yep. They believe that cash is king. And so they're going to be a more challenging transaction a lot of times than somebody who's getting a loan and jumping through hoops to get that done. Well, and you know, if they have more at risk with their earnest money and all of these other things, your, your, your loan client is going to be jumping through hoops the whole time to make sure because they have more to lose. And that money means more to them, unfortunately. So I pulled some statistics. First of all, a lot of these people think that cash buyers are these um, uh, companies that are iBuyer companies, they're offer pads um, and things of that nature. But the fact of the matter is, is they appear to be a cash buyer. They come across as a cash buyer, but they're, they, 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 they act like a cash buyer. They think they can call the shots. 
They don't make it as easy for the seller. The seller thinks it because it's cash, it's easy. A cash buyer thinks that you're right. Their cash is king and that the seller is going to do whatever they want because they're paying cash. They also are the quickest to walk away from a transaction where somebody that's invested that needs a home to live in isn't so easy to walk away from a transaction. They need the home to live in. That's for them personally. It's not just a transaction. It's a new home. And well, and, and buyers, let me hit on that. I got, I got to interrupt you for a minute. A home buyer who's actually getting a loan and that is the home for them and it is their residence, they are emotionally invested is basically what you're saying. And remember, the strongest sales made out there are emotion backed by logic. When you have an investor or a cash buyer that is an investor or an LLC or any of those things, that home is just numbers. It's sure it just is. ratios. And when they go in to do that inspection, and, and they're usually going to take a little bit longer to do that inspection too. They're not doing a three-day inspection. They're not doing a five-day inspection. They're taking 10 days to do the inspection because they're going to have contractors out there and everything else. If there's anything in that period that does not fit into the ratios that they had put in their head before they made the offer, they're gone. Yes. And then you're starting at ground zero again. You're starting all over again. Yep. And the other thing is, is you, you, I heard you mentioned in your classes, continue to follow up. Let's just say you're making multiple offers and you weren't accepted. I find mm -hmm. that realtors that follow up for their client might be the one that's picked when a deal falls through because that seller may have picked them over, uh, picked a cash buyer over them, but the, then the deal might've gone South. And if that realtor is calling listing agent, everything going okay on your transaction, I just want you to know that we're willing to be, you know, we're willing to make an offer if something falls through and you'd be surprised how many of those fall through and you can be right in there and that can be your home. Um, I want to thank you for the time that you spent with me today. I learned so much from you. I'm going to tell you something. Um, I got, I got five tickets. I got four left for your event on the fourth and the fifth of, uh, of April. Uh, mm -hmm. and again, it's from, I think nine to three 30, you said nine to four, nine, nine to three, three. Yep. nine to three at the double tree in Orlando. So close by easy access. You don't even need to get a room. If you live in Orlando, you live out of the area and you're listening to this, maybe you need to call and get a room at the double tree, but I will tell you something. Not only will you learn something from Tina at the relationship, the realtor relationship event that she teaches, but I learned a lot from other agents that you had come in and speak during the event that I was like, this was fantastic. I don't care if you're with Coldwell Banker, Keller Williams, EXP, Century 21, ERA. I don't care if you have your own brokerage. Come to Tina. This is not directed towards any brokerage. There is no oh sales pitch in this. There is no recruiting event in this. This is down and dirty. Get your business in line so that you can have more success and be a better servant leader to your buyers and your sellers. If you would like, I've got, like I said, four tickets. Just text me at 407-250-9144. It's 407-250-9144. Tina, I'd love to interview on my radio show someday. I think that would be great. I think a lot of people could learn a lot from you. And I'm looking forward to attending your event on the 4th and the 5th. So thank you for joining me. Tina, um, how would people reach you if they had questions for you or wanted to uh, enroll in the class? Um, they can go to Eventbrite and look up relationship real estate. They can also email me at tina at tinavaliant.com. And I will respond to them or my assistant well with a link. Um, also, I'm going to put my number out there. If you guys have questions or you need help with something, I am just like all of you. My number is 602-644-0591. And I do want to mention, we won't be back in Orlando doing this event for at least a year. This is the last chance. Well, that's disappointing. I know. <laughs> I got to go other places, Bruce. I, I got to go to do. Austin and Listen, Michigan and Tina, all over Tina the place. travels all over the <laughs> United States. I'm surprised you're not doing Canada yet, but uh, that would probably be next. Um, but please, Tina at Tina Valiant. That's uh, Tina and Tina Valiant, V-A-L-I-A-N-T. 
So that's, uh, or if you, you've got my contact information, I can connect you to it. I happen to have four tickets left. I will give them out to the first four people that contact me. Thank you again, Tina. And I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, next week. I'm looking forward to it as well. And thanks for having me, Bruce. You're welcome. Bye now. Yes. Bye.